Hi everyone, welcome to Wandering DMs. I'm Paul. And I'm Dan, and today on Wandering DMs, we are brought to you with the help of Describe.com, which has a special offer just for Wandering DMs viewers, but more on that later. What I really want to get to is the topic of today's episode, and today we have very special guest John Peterson with us, and we could not be uh, more happy to have gotten some of John's time. So John, of course, is the author of Playing at the World, which is one of my uh, favorite ever uh, history of D&D uh, texts which I keep on my bookshelf at close, uh, close hand, and I have marks for particular quotes when I need to throw it at particular people. Um, and of course, uh, John has a new book out at the end of uh, last year called um, The Elusive Shift, uh, How Role-Playing Games Forge Their Identity. And uh, John there has the physical copy, and I've been reading the digital copy the last few days. So, um, so we, just before we started the chat, of course, John was telling us about a whole bunch of new things that he's been able to dig up in the last few years uh, and add to an, uh, a, a, an updated work with the information that he has. Um, and one thing I noticed, John, is um, it seems like the, just the last couple of years there's been a real rise in academic publications on the history of gaming. Do you, am, I, am I right about that? Do you think that's going to continue? I do, and, and let me say first of all, of course, Dan and, and Paul, thanks so much for having me. Uh, pleasure yes, to join you this morning. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is exciting, right? I mean, so the whole reason the elusive shift came about um, and was published through MIT Press, which is pretty cool, right, is because uh, they had done a book called Zones of Control, which was an anthology about the history and practice of wargaming. And I got recruited to write basically the first chapter of that on the history of war games. It was kind of through that that I got connected with uh, the series editor for this game histories series that MIT is doing. And uh, that ultimately led to the publication of The Elusive Shift through them, which is, it was one of these projects I've had around since like 2015. I was never really sure what I'd do with. And in part because, I mean, as you pointed out, like it, it's not like this is a traditional subject of you know tremendous academic scrutiny there are, are certainly game studies departments and I, I work with a few of them i was just lecturing at uh, usc actually uh the week before last i think um and i've certainly worked with stanford with nyu uh, with ucla where you know there are substantial you know game labs right that are focused on kids a lot of these kids you know they they hope to grow up to be video game designers right that that's a big industry at the moment um but you know there has been this acknowledgement really over the past decade of the degree to which tabletop rpgs um informed if not determined right so many of the principles that um are responsible for those games now another thing of course has happened in the last five years or so which is the astounding unexpected and tremendous resurgence of tabletop rpgs thanks to the publication of fifth edition and of course um little brady bunch rooms just like this one where people play these games <laughs> online some of them very very glamorous articulate um you know charming people to watch play these games and I, that has exerted no small influence as well on um this resurgence of interest but yeah i mean i i think we're gonna see this uh continue frankly i mean i think people have become persuaded now as we approach the 50 year 50 year half century landmark of the publication of D&D, that there really is a lot of, first of all, work that can be done. And a lot of what I focus on um, in my own research and writing is just showing the space that is available for study, what, what the sources are, where you can find them and why they're important. And like, let's do that while we still can, because a lot of these sources, they're ephemeral paper sources. Um, some of them are incredibly scarce and at you know, a critical conservation risk. And so, yeah, you, you see kind of permeating everything I do, trying to just get as much down as we can now, because if, like me, you believe people are still going to be playing D&D in 100 years, right? Like, you know, the, these uh, seminal moments that we, we still have access to so many of the principles, so, many of the, so much of the raw data, um, you know, it, it would be an abrogation in our responsibilities, frankly, to posterity if we weren't out here trying to get academia interested and engaged in this and so yes I, I definitely believe there's there's more to come along these lines cool cool you know I, i'll point out um it was uh it was two weeks back on this show that we had griff morgan on as a guest uh who of course made the secrets of blackmore film and uh of course his, his labor 
uh, you know, somewhat different than yours is to go around and actually interview uh, the principals involved with the, the beginning of D&D. And one thing he pointed out, of course, you mentioned the 50th anniversary, and in April will be the 50th anniversary specifically of Dave Arneson announcing he was going to run some kind of newfangled game based on Bronstein. Uh, so that that's totally is the 50th anniversary of that this year. And one thing reviewing Secrets of Blackmore is there's, you know, there's a large number of people that Griff got interviews for that have passed away just in the last couple of years since he was doing that. So we, we, we absolutely are on the cusp of this moment of uh, the, the principal still being with us and having a, a, a small window where that's, that's possibly the case. Yeah, and I mean, and obviously I commend them for their work getting these people's stories, like, recorded, right? And un unfortunately, you know, so many of these old timers, they want to do a memoir, but they can't really, like, quite get it together. And, mm -hmm. like, you know, hack, hack, you kind of have to go out and find a lot of these people and talk to them to get their stories. And so it's crucially important that, that we be engaged in that as well, definitely. Yeah. You know, another thing, I mean, so, you know, it's a little surprising to me that, there are these game design study departments, actually. I'm a little behind the, the ball on that. And one thing, you know, so, so Paul and I met uh, when we were doing video games together, and then I went, took a path of actually got an academic job in math. Paul has been in video games all along. Paul, have you, have you had the opportunity to, so I mean, I usually think about engineering stuff. At this point, have you had an opportunity to work with a game designer that came out of an academic game design program? Oh, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, I've worked at companies where I ran the internship program, so I was regularly, regularly visiting places okay. like uh, Champlain College or um, uh, 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 um, SNHU or various places that have whole programs around game development. It's, it's pretty big. And, and yeah, we've hired, we've hired uh, you know, the, the next generation of game designers certainly have that background. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah, when I, that's very different from when I, with a couple of years that I was in it a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, yeah. so back, so back to the elusive chip. So, so, um, John, the, the, um, I think that the, the germ of the elusive shift from, from what I read came from a really interesting conversation you had with Jonathan Tweet, I think, and a question that the two of you, I guess, crafted together. Maybe you could tell our viewers what, what the question you and, you and Jonathan Tweet came up with that kind of launched you on this. Yeah, so I, I tell the story actually at the very beginning of Elusive Shift about how I first met Jonathan actually over at Peter Atkinson's house and we were playing some board games. And I think, I think he was actually trying to like distract me from, from <laughs> like, you know, peppering these historical, like, deep questions that I then had to think through. But, like, the one that really stuck with me from that is he asked me kind of what was the first game system you can think of that models the structure of a narrative rather than the physics of a world. And, you know, when we look at the history of war games, right, war games that are focused on um, conflict simulation, like, they, they tend to be very much about, okay, how far can things move over this time? What's the range of this type, type of weapon? How accurate is this type of weapon at that range? You know, how can the effects of that weapon be mitigated by various kinds of armor or, or what have you? And, you know, they're based on this sort of sandbox model, right? And um, what plays out in the conflict, I mean, it's presumed it's a conflict, right? The, the story of sitting down to play a war game is you're doing Gettysburg. And like, you know, here's where your artillery is, here's where your cavalry is, and like, you know, so the question he was asking was, surely there was some kind of a shift at some point where people instead looked at, you know, how do you, um, just to borrow a uh, tagline of one of the theorists I discussed in the Lucid Shift, like, you know, when did it start to move to resolving, like, meaningful questions, like, within a dramatic structure? And, like, this was a captivating question for me. I mean, the, the first thing I kind of threw back at him, if I recall, was that I believed saving throws, actually, were not a mechanism that modeled a property of a physical world. That mm -hmm. when you read the way people talked about saving throws, they modeled instead this property that heroes have in heroic narratives of being able to avoid death. And, 
you know, this, this culminates, you know, for me in mechanisms like the fame and fortune points of top secret, something I talk about a great deal in the elusive shift because they've had such a profound influence on design to follow. They were maybe the single most influential design innovation of the seventies. Uh, top secret didn't come out until 80, of course, but the ideas were already kind of bouncing around by 78. And, th and this notion that, you know, you want to model properties like, you know, if you're James Bond, how famous you are. And the fact that you're too famous to die to this kind of circumstance, and there's a player <laughs> currency you can expend such that this particular assassin, he didn't actually get you, right? Because James Bond wouldn't be, wouldn't go down like that. And, you know, I mean, I think there are, there are a variety of similar mechanisms that were in place. And, you know, Top Secret is a great example of this. It's a design that I, I know has a lot of a lot of fans in the old school community. Certainly Jason Elliott has done a tremendous amount to promote it and to promote Merle's work. But I still think it's actually an understudied game in, in a number of respects for just how many innovations came from it. And one of the things we show in the Elusive Shift actually is material from the draft of Top Secret that Merle was concocting in the late 70s that would ultimately appear in Dragon Number 40 as well um, that shows a narrative map of what like a story of a secret agent is like from you know creating the character to okay the, you get assigned to a mission you know you do the mission you get to the location you you know scope out what's going on you execute the mission but there could be complications and they take the following forms it include you get captured you get jailed and you have to escape and he has this like flow chart that shows how all these elements come together and yeah, I mean, I think that you can make a very decisive element that any game that is, you know, fund its fundamental philosophy is being, you know, grounded in something like a narrative map like that satisfies uh, Tweet's argument. Tweet, Tweet, of course, was was thinking this was a much, much later thing, right? That this was mm. something that yeah. happened maybe in the yeah. 90s, right, or the late 80s. And um, he, he is a designer, I should say, that I have a, a tremendous amount of respect for. Like Ars Magica is one of my favorite fantasy games. I think Over the Edge is a game that in, any game designer would be should be jealous of because of its just sheer awesomeness. <laughs> and of course, FFA and Third Ed D&D, I mean, you know, and his work now in 13th Age. Um, so, somebody who's, whose opinion I take very seriously, I guess I'd say, in terms of the principles of design theory. And, you know, is privileged to be able to, you know, bounce ideas off of him, off of uh, Luke Crane, the designer of Burning Wheel. Mm -hmm. He and I talked a lot about system resolution and intentions, statements of intention, and how those turn into resolutions. I mean, really, the, in, the entire chapter called How to Play in Elusive Shift is, is just from my conversations with Luke about what, what people really thought they were doing when they said, I tried to open the door. <laughs> and like what, what happens, right? Is a result what, how that gets res is there some rule that does that? Does DM Fiat do that? Like how how does it actually work? And you know, we we cover a lot of kind of aberrant corner cases around that in in that chapter because it's uh there, there's a ton of variation in the way that people thought about this from very early on. There's a really interesting parallel here. I, lo I love that you were picking on saving throws as a as a. a an exemplar of of narrative gaming because I feel like in the in the earlier works there was it wasn't that narrative was missing but it was just like implied rather than explicitly stated. Uh, Dan and I were talking about this just last week about uh, going over in in the little brown books what what players could spend their money on and there's this whole section on spies and you know and it just covers the raw mechanics of like how much does a spy cost and what is their chance of success but it doesn't really say that like. Well, there's there's something to spy on, right? There's things are happening in the game. They, this narrative bent that that I actually meet a spy to go find information. What is that information? That all that's missing, but I think is kind of just implied by the fact that you could hire a spy. Yeah, and you'll, you'll see a lot of things like that. I mean, you know, na narrative means different things to different people, um, obviously. And you know, writing about all this in the elusive chef, you know, I I put up a lot of hazard tape in you know drawing you know the, to surround drawing analogies between the way people thought about these things in the 70s and the way people mm -hmm. thought about them in the post forge world right so nar narrative means different things to different people <laughs> um, but yeah i mean the, the the reason why i lighted on saving throws in particular are on that um, was largely because of the way gygax talks about it in a late source late to me in the dmg right mm -hmm. and like the, the ad and d system you know, really enforces that notion that it models like what a Conan would have, 
Um, clearly, if you go back to like DGOTS and Chainmail, you know, the, the wargaming systems that, that uh, saving throws came from, I don't think you see the same implication there, but you see it pretty quick as soon as people started thinking about this as a role-playing game. And it is that narrative infusion, I think, that mm. idea that there is a story that we're generating with this that wasn't present in at least most wargaming um, that, like, you know, inform the way that those system uh, properties w would be understood and how, how what they were modeling would be understood. So I, I guess we should we, we kind of jump way way on the, in the deep end, which we like. <laughs> one, one thing I should point out to our viewers is that I mean, fr from what I can tell in the elusive ship, the structure, just exactly what John's been talking about, the structure has been um, to 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 inspect or to identify two separate camps that have become interested in role playing games, and one is war gamers, and one is people interested in literature. People, so at least for the historical threads, you had people who were doing war games in the 50s and 60s and people who were really getting into sci-fi fantasy literature like Tolkien and the, the, the game really bringing those two threads together in ways that are, are sometimes compatible and sometimes uh, a source of great tension. Um, and uh, so maybe, John, tell us, like, which, which one has more? Like, like... What, what, there, are there more war gamers, or are there more people interested in in, in fantasy literature at the inception of D and D? By far the latter. Yeah, I mean, so okay. I mean, the, the monumental popularity of Tolkien. I mean, Tolkien was a number one bestseller on the New York Times list for months, right? Like in the late sixties. Um, vastly more people had come into contact with fantasy and science fiction um, at the time D and D came out than had come into contact with war gaming, right? When we mm. when we even try to measure the size of that community. I mean, people ventured guesses in the, you know, 200, 300,000 wargamers, of whom, you know, a five-digit number were the serious people, right? And if you, you look at these clubs that Gygax was involved in, like the International Federation of Wargaming, right? These, these are clubs that had like 500 members, maybe the Spartans had like some members. So these, these were minuscule activities compared to, um, you know, what you would see at a, a Worldcon, what, what you would see, you know, again, in major clubs surrounding science fiction and fantasy. But, but if you take it, you know, measured by Tolkien fandom alone, um, sure, it's 100x, 1,000x what Wargaming was. Right, right. And, and, and the other interesting thing is uh, you have this much larger bulk of people uh, knowledgeable about fantasy literature and things like that, but... Uh, Gygax and Arneson, the, 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 the creators of D&D, &D, were clearly more on the war game side, interestingly enough. And one thing that we've, we've seen, you know, partly talking to Griff a couple weeks ago, is whereas Arneson is, I think, in, in popular culture, uh, seen as a loosey-goosey, you know, I ad-lib the game, whatever. When you look at what Arneson wrote, it was very sophisticated, long, dense, complicated war game style uh, detailed rules, um, and both Gygax and Arneson were very heavily on that war game side. Um, you know, one thing I got to say when I when I opened up the Elusive Shift and saw that this was, to a large degree, the structure of the book, it really hit me like a thunderbolt, because uh, here on the Wandering DMs channel, for example, in the last week, entities, right? But I think there there is an analog to. The war, war game is the sciences, and you know, fantasy fiction is the humanities, and and there there is this just conflict, and you see this in the earliest people like Lou Pulsifer, for example, in seventy seven, writing in the first issue of White Dwarf, kind of poses these fundamental questions like, is you know, okay, there's this new thing D and D that people are doing. Are you supposed to play it as a game? Or are you supposed to play it as a like acting on a novel? And, you know, like, th th these were the table stakes of the initial discussions of what became role-playing game theory, was people saying, yes, there is this conflict, and it manifested from whether people perceived, you know, the relationship between the players and the referee or dungeon master as, you know, adversarial or cooperative, right? Is the, is the DM there to mess with you? To, is he playing against you? Um, you know, or is the DM's function to kind of... Um, facilitate, right, the adventure that the players want to have and to lead to a, a, a pleasant story outcome for all of them. And you, you see people very early on, you know, 75, 76, feeling that tension when they came from a group that was more in the science fiction fandom camp, 
and would go play with war gamers, you know, it, it seemed like it was an entirely different game. And that's, that's a big part of understanding early D&D is that both of these philosophies were there from the start. Now, the, the tools and technologies that people have since used to kind of delineate more story-focused gaming from conflict simulation, like those didn't exist yet, right? But I think they understood the problem, right? They, they, they knew what they were trying to get. And, you know, you can always argue how successful these games have actually been that offer these features to make things more story-driven and less simulation-driven. But, like, definitely um, that has become a whole independent branch of literature. And there are people out there who argue that these, these story games, right, are not even RPGs at all, that they're, they're a different category. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I got to admit, it was kind of eye-opening to me to see uh, in the elusive shift just how early that was. So you have a couple of quotes uh, like popped out to me from Jim Mitchie as early as uh, '76, saying that people recommending that people really rely on uh, their storytelling arts is the phrase that he was using over and over again. Of sure, the 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 D and D or whatever system has random elements. But the goal of the DM or the referee is to knit them together into a coherent narrative plot going forward and to rely on those storytelling arts, as he put it. And I, I wouldn't have guessed that there was writings as early as 76 in that. Um, now, I'm someone, okay, so I'm someone who, you know, I grew up in a really rural area and I, I did not have access to any kind of zines or anything like that or know about them growing up, is I only had the official publications that had you know, Gygax's name on it or something like that. How, how buried are those kinds of conversations, those really early conversations about how important storytelling are? I mean, it's, it's an interesting question in that, you know, there was this vibrant community that was engaging, I think, trying to do RPG theory from the very start, but it was a tiny one. It was, and it was, you know, in many respects, isolated from what you would read in the big glossy zines. Now, there there was, by the end of the 70s, a bit of a shift around that as well, in that, you know, the creation of different worlds, for example, like, you know, Glenn Blacko's famous Blacko model, which he published in a very obscure fanzine called The Wild Hunt, right, which probably had a copy count of 150 or 200 copies at the time. Um, if his essay had been, you know, consigned to, to merely that for all of posterity, we might not even know it, right? But because it got into different worlds, and different worlds had a wider readership, because you had the space gamer, you had, you know, there, 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 there was kind of a bridging function, I'd say. Many of these discussions certainly started out in very obscure corners of the community, but they were able to get into White Dwarf, and a lot of people read White Dwarf, right? And a, a lot of people read those, those not-quite-dragon tier but these kind of mid-tier zines, especially people that were pushing competing systems. And that, that, I guess, another aspect of this that's crucial to understand is that, you know, even as um, isolated as some of these conversations may have been and as few people as they may have reached, these were the people who were vocal enough and determined enough to go on and publish their own games and become all these obscure to, to us obscure, but published RPG titles, right, of the 70s. And that, that was one of the great, you know, kind of fun parts of this project for me, was trying to make my own assessment of really what were the games that should count as RPGs that were published before 1980, right? And I, and I count around 50, which is, you okay. know, a substantial number, right? Um, many quite obscure. But, like, that, there was that much um, confidence, I guess, in the community and the idea that, hey, I can, I can be Gygax, right? I can go out and do um, an RPG system and it may not reach as many people as D&D did, but it'll be the way I want it to be. It's the way me and my friends play. You should try it. We have some good ideas. And like that, rescuing some of those from obscurity uh, has been a mission of mine. Obviously, anybody who is familiar with my blog and so on, I try to catalog all these uh, forgotten variants, as I call them. Um, that process was a big part of the fun for me of going through and doing it. Great, great. Yeah, you you uh, put everybody else to shame in the uh, the D and D historian uh, camp. So the things that you uh, managed to pull up on your blog, uh, which of course is uh, playing at the world dot blogspot dot com for anybody that wants to that doesn't know that already, um, is always really eye opening. I really always love seeing the things that you've come up with. You know, one of the early quotes that I, that, I, that I adore and go back to from time to time is, I can't remember who said it, but really early on saying, D&D uh, &D is too important to leave up to Gary Gygax. 
Um, yeah. And I really, very, very early on, it was perceived as like something different is happening here, and it's really culturally rele relevant. That's already outgrown the creators very rapidly. Well, I mean, when you when you produce a game that you know, there's a critic named John Freeman I talk about a lot in Elusive Chef, who said that it's really not so much a game as a design a game kit. Uh, D and D. And maybe, you know, it's even less that than a system for designing a game system. Now, we're talking about OD&T here, right? Not AD&D. But if, if you look at OD&D with all its text about how these are guidelines for you to follow in, you know, creating your own game of tremendous simplicity or complexity, like, you know, this real Burger King have it your way that suffuses the OD&D publications, you can understand why everybody who engaged with this, right, did so thinking they were on the status of a Gygax, right? I mean, that's the point. Like, and you, you see this, you know, in very biting criticisms from people like Ed Symbolist, who would say, you know, if you're building a world with any plausibility, with any role-playing element and so on, out, off the D&D &D rules, that's you. That's not what's in the published rules. Like, you know, you made that. You can say, I use D&D &D to do that. That's, you know, the, I mean, the analogy is I use this canvas to paint, you know, water lace, right? <laughs> and like, I mean, Ed Simmons, he, saw, he didn't see D&D &D as much more than a canvas that, like, people had painted on. And um, obviously, they're, they're, this is a tremendous controversy. I'm not endorsing anyone's perspective in that controversy. I just think it's interesting that so early on, yeah, G Gary Gygax was another referee with his ideas, publishing his little addenda to the system through Strategic Review or, or Dragon Magazine. <laughs> I think that's great. I mean, sometimes I struggle about whether that has been lost or not. I mean, on the one hand, you know, obviously the, the published books nowadays are very large and very detailed. But on the other hand, you know, we have this culture in this community where people are going even farther afield uh, in, in role-playing designs than anything the original designers conceived of. Um, do, do, do you think that the, the, the size... I mean, when was, the, when was the last D and D book that said this is a framework? I mean, do they do they still say that today? I mean, maybe Paul can can speak to that because you actually run a fifth edition game, and I don't. Um, yeah, I don't think it uses that exact phrase. Um, yeah, I don't. I, I couldn't answer it. I couldn't answer it. John, do you have? I, I believe there. I believe there still is some language. I think every edition of D and D still has some vestige of Rule Zero ish language around mm. it. Um, and you know, I mean, if you just look at the diversity of new practices they're introducing in books like Tasha, for example, right? Like, I mean, they're definitely interested in having this game. It's a, it's fundamental guts be reconfigurable. And, you know, I, I don't think you can ever take it away. I guess this is my point. Um, and, you know, I, at the very end of Evolution Shift, I talk about how even after AD&D came out, right, and Gygax was now saying, no, 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 this, this is not open. This is not, like, a framework anymore. Like, this is a complete game, and you can, like, play it this way. At least publicly he was claiming that. How successful he was at actually delivering a game that accounted for all the things you'd need to be able to account for, right, is, a, is an entirely separate question. But, like, you know, that... Nobody listened, right? People still hack <laughs> AD&D any way they wanted. People, Dragon Magazine still published people hacking AD&D, like uh, proposing you could build an AD&D system editions that would look like this or that, and that were non-canonical, right? But at the same time, were ser a serious part of everybody's play style. So that Pandora's box, once you open it, I don't think you get to close it. <laughs> and you know, a lot of the point of elusive shift as well is that this this Pandora's box is an inheritance, right, of the legacy of wargaming. It's an inheritance of free Kriegspiel, of these ideas that really you do just publish guide like all that guidelines text. It's just copied from Chainmail, right? And that's just copied and from take your pick from Corns, from like you know things Leon Tucker and Mike Reese were writing about tank battles. Like everyone had this notion that this was just guidelines or a framework, and that you're kind of supposed to hack it, and you know, I mean, D and D and Chainmail are about equally playable without going and inventing all the systems you need to actually play them. Right? It's just a grab bag yeah. of rules that don't really give you much fundamental guidance on what the moment-to-moment -moment play of the game is is like. It's true. It's true. You know, one one of the points that I really liked in the Elusive Shift was that even though there's a lot of um, contrast uh, and tension between the wargamer camp and the the literary camp. 
at the time, one thing they both shared was flying the flag of fan creations and flexibility and we can all be creative. And that was, that was a common link that, that both camps shared um, that, I, that I really liked. We, you know, I, I think just a couple, we- like a couple weeks back, you had a, uh, an article on your blog about the origin of what now people refer to as Rule Zero that you mentioned a while back. Um, and I, th- I thought it was really fascinating that there's, you know, a tradition of, particularly from the war game side, uh, not necessarily considering that possibly to be the the er principle of what a game should be, and uh, frankly, I got a, into a little spat on on social media with someone trying to trying to point out that there was at least a different side to the argument. Um, and then a couple of minutes back, you mentioned Corns, and of course, Corns had uh, his rule one prior to that. And I'm trying to remember what was what was Corns rule one again. Uh, there is only one rule in our war game to simulate reality. That's it. There you and go. It, there are see, there's, rules. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's the there. I see that makes sense to me. Corn's rule number one is to simulate reality. Makes a lot of sense to me, and I'm glad to have it on the on the text. Um, and I will probably start um, uh, probably start slapping people across the face with that <laughs> in various debates. I mean, Dan, that's got an interesting conta- uh, contrast with what what you boiled down as sort of the the, the golden rule uh, as presented by Gygax in um, uh, where's that? Is then the intro to uh, to the first edition player's handbook? Maybe uh, it's a DM's guide. The DM's, yeah, guide. DM's Thank guide. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. Can, you, can you tell us uh, how what's the boiled down version that you? published yeah okay so 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 in the introduction there and, and and a lot of people quote this and emphasize a different part of it frankly and the part that i emphasize is you know gygax recoiling from that says ad and d is not trying to simulate anything uh uh when except it says we, well we're trying to simulate stuff as much as possible but when it becomes unplayable playability wins so in a in a narrow in it we, we would like to ma- maximize both resolution and playability, and if it if it if you if you can't pick, then you have to pick playability over simulation. So, uh, and I and I I would still hold that as the golden rule. But uh, when people overemphasize the you know the I, I don't really believe him when he says we're not trying to simulate anything. Mm. We're clearly trying to we are we're clearly simulating something. Um, it's not what Arneson's trying to do in uh, the Blackmore supplement, but um, so I mean, the, the, I mean to be perfectly honest, of course, playability still wins out. But I, I like <laughs> that 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 sim, you know simulating something efficiently, elegantly is still on the table. So I think that I, I would still want to remind people about that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Any any anybody feel free to tell me that I'm crazy. About that. <laughs> You're not, you're not crazy. I mean, and, and it's consistent with what Gary said even way before D and D came out, right? That if you give him that the classic, you know, realism versus playability trade off, which had been articulated by the wargaming community since the '60s, maybe in the late '50s. I mean, it started in Wargame Digest. You really start to see people talk about that being the fundamental design decision in wargaming. Uh, Gary always sided on playability. Um, period. And like, yeah. I would not characterize AD&D as particularly playable rule set in the sense of it's a complex and prescriptive rule set um, with lots of fiddly buttons in it. But it's also clear that he completely didn't play by it, right? And like you know, he, I mean, you know, there there are so many escape valves, so many places where he says, "Well, actually," and I'm not talking about outside the DMG. In the DMG, there are escape valves. They're like, "Well, there's a die roll, and you don't really feel like that." will lead to the story going where you want the story to go for these players, feel free to ignore it. Like, just keep it behind the DM screen. Um, so, I mean, at the end of the day, like I said, it's a lot easier to claim you have a closed system than it is to actually close one. Mm. I think that, unfortunately, mm. is still a, a deficiency in the way a lot of people look at um, RPG and story game design. It's, it's a lot easier to say, okay, every, you know, there, there's no, none of that rule zero is stuff here. Everything is like on the table and like you, you're supposed to play our game by the specific rules that have been laid down in the book, which you're supposed to memorize and articulate. Um, I, I, I tend not to view those as very credible statements. Uh, Gary's um, G- Gary in uh, AD and D saying here's a rule and you should in a lot of cases ignore it is a large degree why I don't have any hair anymore. <laughs> um, that is really 
that's someone a little bit on the spectrum. It's hard, that's hard for me to digest. <laughs> you know, let me ask one thing. So, so in the history at the time of the the goulash of you've got war gaming, you've got literature, you've got fantasy elements, you have diplomacy uh, in the mix there. You have uh, Midgard, you know, happening things like that. A lot of that stuff at one point was done play by mail. And I think that like in our discussions on this show, one thing that we've kind of realized has dawned on us in the last year is there's a lot of mechanics or suggestions in classic D and D, particularly for things like uh, baronies or economies or building castles that kind of work. Um, if you have players isolated from each other and you know, like like with Dave Arneson, he had at least a couple of players that would just phone call him up on the phone, right? So the game wasn't actually running, but he'd have a player call him up on the phone, and he would have to run the one player on the phone in isolation uh, in a lot of events. And uh, a lot of those kinds of mechanics that are kind of interesting for one player, you know, making a decision as a captain or a king on their own that don't work so well, and I've made a huge disaster mishmash of this myself, don't work so well together when you have a party of people around a table. Um, how important were, like for those early mechanics, was it that a lot of people were playing by mail? And is, is that something that just can't happen anymore? Um, so this is something I've actually, since the pandemic, um, I've written a couple blog posts about the influence of play-by-mail on the early D&D community because, I mean, by 1975, you can already find 10, like, well-known play-by-mail campaigns at a time that you have a hard time identifying 10 in-person campaigns that were well-known, <laughs> right? Like, in the sense of, <laughs> they were there, but it's just, of the things that we have documentary traces of, these are, like, some of the best documentary traces we have of play in that era. And it did, it, it springboarded off of diplomacy. Many people were familiar with the idea that you sent orders to a GM um, at a, you know, whatever biweekly cadence, and the, the GM would report back to the group, here's what happened as a result. And that feedback loop has a lot in common with the dialogue feedback loop of D&D. And uh, Midgard, as you pointed out, is, is precisely the same thing. Um, I often call Midgard D&D's closest cousin, you know, even though it was primarily done through mail, not exclusively, but primarily, like, you know, it was a fantasy game where you played characters in a fantastic world and there was a referee and you could do, you know, propose to do anything. And if there weren't rules, you would work out what the rules were. were. And like, it was this, it's so close, so close, just didn't quite get the alchemy precisely calibrated to um, what D&D unlocked for all of us. But I do think it's, I think it's tremendously important, to be honest. Um, and the efforts that people made to try to get play-by-mail to work, um, you know, show, again, this, this fundamental open-endedness and flexibility of D&D as a product. Because there's, you know, you, you could even make a not crazy argument that these play-by-mail attempts were some of the dominant approaches early on to D&D. Like, the, these weren't like a marginal thing. Like, these were cases that got a lot of people engaged with the game. And, you know, like, um, I think it's, its legacy is tied up in that. I'm, I'm always reminded, whenever we get into this, this thing about the telephones, too, that, like, you know, Arnold Hendrick, right, who wrote this notorious uh, early review of D&D in 1974, kind of bashing it, kind of like this game doesn't, you know, I don't really understand how you're supposed to do this. And, like, one of the things he suggests is that the game could really only be best played by telephone. Precisely because of the secret information, the you know that it is just theater of the mind. It really takes place in this conversation. I mean, he thought the telephone was the ideal medium for engaging the game, and so everybody who was consigned to Zoom or whatever today, you know, you're you're playing it a way that in 1974 <laughs> people thought was the right way to play. <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating. fascinating. Um, if I could, I could take us a quickly on a on a small tangent here, John. I'm really curious when you're talking about play by mail about it being uh, something that left behind artifacts so that we know more about it, uh, or you're talking about um, you know using sources like like zines. Um, I'm kind of curious if there's um, this was this was commented in our chat earlier. If there's any ongoing effort to um, like archive or digitize those original sources, is is this material that that our average viewer can get at and do their own research, or uh, is it really consigned to just the the hardcore collectors who have piles of of old original print? 
When I did playing at the World, I worked primarily from the University of California at Riverside's archives, the Bruce Pelt fanzine archive, which is a good place to get a lot awesome. of California fandom stuff. Um, now at Bowling Green State University, um, that the Brown Popular Culture Library as well is one that I work from. You know, I pointed out to many years for people who are asking about Domesday books, they have Domesday books in their archive. You can just like go get them copied there. That's what I did when I was trying to piece all this together. Um, obviously, you know, there's just so much of it mm. that like, you know, I mean, how much of that is digitized? How much could be freely available? I mean, the, the legal questions of that, I, I don't touch. Um, but like the just the practical question. I mean, there would need to be money and a plan, right, to even get this to where you're capturing a tenth of this material. Now we'll get there. And partly what'll happen is, you know, I mean, the major fanzine collectors, I understand, you know, are working with institutions like The Strong in Rochester, which already has, I mean, they got all of Darwin Bromley's stuff. They, they have, you know, uh, Sid Saxon stuff, like, which includes a tremendous amount of these small press games and zines. I'm aware of a couple of zine collections that are destined to them in particular. And it'll be research institutions like that, ultimately, that I think will help to make these things available, um, hmm. you know, to a broader scholarship. But let's face it, this is in its infancy. I mean, like I said, a lot yeah. of what I'm trying to do in my work is just even identify what's worth looking at. Like right. I do so many fishing trips. I've looked at so many tens of thousands of zines, and, you know, 90% of which there's nothing really salient to the mm -hmm. things that we're interested in. But you got all, Cause you never know somebody could have written in a letter, you know, you could have gotten this like one person saying this and so you have to look at all of it. And even just being able to broadly say, okay, here's some set of, you know, 15 or 20,000 like zines that we think are important. is kind of what I'm, what I'm trying to get to. I mean, to me, gotcha. it's high level cursory research of identifying broad swaths of where there's interesting material. If, if I'm right and years from now, academics still will think it is worth studying this because of the tremendous influence it's had on world culture, then I mean, there's, you know, work, you know, there's room for far more detailed and rigorous scholarship hmm. around this than, than I'm able to conduct at this point. I, I kind of imagine 50 years from now, uh, I, I equivalent researchers pawing through gigabytes of backed up blogs from right now, because of course there's <laughs> there's tons of them and we're all writing about this stuff and uh, I'm sure it would be just as tedious to go through all of the uh, all of the gaming blogs right now and try to find those salient, uh, important pieces of information. I mean, the good news is reproduction is good and it's searchable. Like, yeah. you know, even yeah, if you can on yeah. these things, your OCR, I mean, the reproduction is so poor and so much of it, OCR is next to useless. Um, I mean, it, what, okay. what it'll take, again, is an effort that, you know, yeah. I mean, a major research institution would need to make this something that a, a staff worked on for a considerable amount of time to even put a dent in it. Well, if, if any of our viewers are interested in trying to track down those those sources, uh, as someone whose spouse works in interlibrary loan, uh, I bet you could reach out to the interlibrary loan departments of any of those institutions. Uh, a lot of times they do things where uh, a difficult to... Um, to see work that maybe they don't want to send out in the mail to a random person will kind of get digitized on the fly um, to, to, to fulfill a request. So it's worth talking to them. Definitely. Yeah. That's a really fascinating story. Frankly, frankly, John, I wouldn't have guessed that you are uh, 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 struggling to, with the deluge of, of material just to get in broad, broad strokes, actually. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought that. And it really, uh, you know, the world has changed very, a whole lot in my, in my lifetime, personally. And the difference between, you know, me being in college uh, or high school and having to physically go to a library for everything and pouring through individual pages until I just physically found something on the right page, and anything being digitized nowadays and being you know searchable digitally is just mo a monumental difference. And it kind of warms my heart, frankly, that you still have to put on your wizard hat and go pouring through <laughs> physical libraries <laughs> in order to find <laughs> in order to find the specific incantation that you need to 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 uh, to prove a particular point. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, and I buy a lot, obviously, at this point, too. I mean, I, I don't think it's a big secret that I'm one of the major collectors of these fanzines at this point. And so, I mean, I have to deal with the, the paper just that I have, right? And there's so much of it now. And it's, um, yeah, it, it's tough. 
But that, that's what's I, great I, about doing something like this. Yeah, you can like bite off a chunk of this and say, here's some things worth talking about. Like here's some selected essays that from what I've been able to look at anyway, are kind of the, the important ones for moving the ball forward of like how people thought about RPGs. And most of them are in places that are not like prohibitively difficult to, to, to find if you have access to a BGSU or something like it. Fascinating. And we're pretty convinced by your background that, that yeah, you are you are a pretty <laughs> dedicated collector and archivist of a lot of a lot of material, which is which is which is very impressive. Um, this is a virtual uh, background actually. This, this is Bill Mayer's I house. I'm just pretending that I'm suspect otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> I handle it. Uh, wow, that is here. That's some amazing VR you have going there. <laughs> really, really good, really good green screen. <laughs> I have so okay, so I have two. I'm gonna have two kind of biggish questions. I'm gonna try to sneak in near the end of the hour here, and one is so you know your 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 chapter on towards a philosophy, um, and uh, you know so you know I'm I'm a guy with a math degree and a philosophy degree, and. We've had, you know, computing people on the show in the last year, and we've had philosophy professors on the show in the last year. And so your sort of climactic chapter in the elusive shift on towards a philosophy, I mean, one thing, Lou Pulsifer is all the way through that. And mm -hmm. that's not a name I think a lot of people would immediately recognize, but it seems like Lou Pulsifer really did a lot of early thinking and a lot of early writing of... Uh, you know, gaming philosophy at at the outset, and and one of the things that Lou identified, from what I can tell, is the difference between, I guess, what I'm going to call a hardcore game right now, where there's a lot of risk and a lot of chance for player for player character death, and escapism. And so, granted that there's been this really, to me, mind blowing explosion of interest in tabletop games in just the last couple of years. Uh, and, and to me, you know, a lot of emphasis on the escapist side. And to me, there's a lot of, you know, early artwork has a lot of medieval frail figures being lacerated and frankly torn up and mutilated. And, you know, modern art now to my, to my grognard eye, uh, is kind of Disney-esque and a lot of glamour shots and stuff like that. And really leaning on what Pulsifer referred to as the escapism side. Is, it, does there seem to be a trend that when the real world gets really bad, and obviously here in the last couple of years we've been struggling with things, <laughs> 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 things including a pandemic. Is do, I mean, do, in in your view of history, does, does it does does and, and I'm also thinking about things like Monopoly, the game Monopoly being at its biggest right in the heights of the depression. Um, do you do you see these things connecting with larger trends historically of like times get bad and therefore people are more interested in escapist type games? Uh, interesting question. And I mean, like as a you know um, a scholar of this, but not an academic historian. You know, I I have the privilege to be able to ignore broader cultural trends in a lot of my work. It's certainly a deficiency that academics constantly see in everything that I do because it is so insularly focused, right, on these communities and kind of what what they thought. You know, I mean. There are broad strokes in which I, I definitely think that's true. Um, even playing at the world talks about, for example, Vietnam and the you know the fact that so many of the atrocities in Vietnam were being televised, that the war was so profoundly unpopular, especially in you know among young people in America. This did, I think, play some small part in the um, the move towards fantasy, an interest in Tolkien first of all, but in the embrace of D and D as well, in the embrace of this kind of more courtly chivalric, um, heroic, um, unambiguous, beautifully dualist, beautifully like there's good and there's evil. And if I slay this orc, and I know I'm stepping into what is currently a bit of a cultural conversation here, right? There, there, yeah. You know, it can't be morally wrong for me to do it because they're innately bad. And yes, I mean, philosophers have constantly pushed back against that, right? I mean, I think, I think Auden actually was probably the first to really push back against Tolkien and said, like, I, I think there's a problem with presenting things with this, like, Manichaean dualism, right? <laughs> like, um, you know, that what, what does it mean for something to be sentient the way that we are sentient and yet, like, bereft of moral agency? It's a serious 
philosophical question for <laughs> ethicists and people other than me to try to figure out. But yeah, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a sense in which you can find the fingerprints of society, like in any mass cultural phenomenon like this, right? And in what's on people's minds. I don't think we've really seen the impact of that, of the travails of the last four years, or depending on your perspective, maybe just the last one. Like, I don't think we've, we've begun to see like design that reflects that or, um, I mean, certainly the pandemic has shifted the way people think about using Zoom to play games and things like that. But has it really changed their content? Is, are they more escapist because of that? Is there in, escapism inherently like a greater appeal because we're all cooped up? I, I haven't been more than five miles from where I'm sitting since last March, right? Like, is that, you know, which is unusual for me, <laughs> you know, is, is, um, you know, is that a factor in the continuing growth of D&D? Probably, to some degree. Probably the escapism of that and the, the high fantasy aspect of it may be the most attractive part as opposed to the disease tables at this point. <laughs> um, on that note, I will remind viewers that uh, next week on Wandering VMs, we'll have uh, Brooklyn-based artist Isabel Garbani with me for an episode titled Eat Plague... Uh, uh, Eat... Eat Plague Love, uh, where we will be discussing D&D disease tables for Valentine's Day. <laughs> so please join us in one week for that. Now, are they specific to things that might befall you on a Valentine's Day, or just diseases in general, like you could catch the flu? Uh, you'll have to tune in. <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to tune in to find out. <laughs> Uh, Great question. <laughs> well played. Well played, Dan. <laughs> oh dear. That's a great. That was a. That was such. A, that was a, such a great answer, John. Actually, that was. There's so many. So many things that we 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 need to dig into in the future on that. And you know, my other question. You know, my my other my other big question was, and this might be a very. This might be a one word answer from you. Is I don't know. In the last year. And we're like we're all on Zoom. We're all playing online, and, and you know I went fully, as you said, I went fully uh, nine months not being in a motorized vehicle, uh, and and not leaving my neighborhood um, here in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. And surely there is no other span of time before or after in my life that that'll ever happen again. Um, and so we're, we're all doing stuff by video, and we're online all the time. And and it dawned on us that we're not aware of any recorded play session by any of the original principles. So at some point I got the itch for like, why isn't there either an audio or video recording of Gygax or Arneson running a session ever or any, or anybody uh, back in the day. And uh, I think, I feel like the closest thing I've seen on your blog is the, uh, the D and D radio pilot. But I think from what we can tell, that was, you know, maybe a play session that then got turned into a script and then was recorded by professional voice actors, I guess. So in, in your awareness, have you ever come across either an audio or video recording of an actual play session so that we could know what the pacing was like and what the, what the verbal back and forth is like and whether there was just a caller on the player side or everybody was involved? Have you ever seen anything like that? No, I'm not aware that anyone uh, documented it that exactly. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a bunch of video and audio footage. A bunch of people went to these conventions and shot things. I see references in fanzines all the time, people saying, I was there with a the Super 8 recording this. Hmm, but really? who knows whatever happened to that, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, it, it could very well be that we'll find something. But broadly, I mean, the thing to remember is this, this guy here, you know, what came out in 2006 or something mm -hmm. and before it could really record good video that would you know Gygax and Arneson had both passed away I mean today we just take for granted like if Gygax and Arneson was still with us we'd have tons of videos of them because everybody's carrying a perfectly good video camera in their pocket all the time and that just wasn't true now there, there's footage of both of them there's interviews with both of them but I don't think people really went out of their way to try to document the way that they ran the game and, you know, I mean, certainly we have no hope that in the 70s anything meaningful will turn up, right? I mean, again, it would have okay. to be somebody super late that it's just been forgotten for, you know, Bob Bledsaw was there at Gen Con in 76 and happened to have a Super 8 and, like, I mean, it's it's possible, but I'm, I'm certainly not aware of any of those things existing. 
Gotcha. I mean, and I would I would kill for an audio tape, right? I mean, I had a, <laughs> I had a cassette recorder, I think, in the seventies, and I would kill for anybody to even just have an audio tape of one of those sessions to know what the what the pacing and the back and forth was like at the time. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, so, you know, for example, when Fritz Leiber in 76 spoke at uh, Gen Con, that was tape recorded, right? Like his entire speech at the Legion Hall was recorded and there's a transcript available of that uh, in, in a game log. Um, <laughs> and so, I mean, it's not that people didn't have tape recorders. It's not they didn't record things. So, I mean, it's, it's possible. Like, but I, I certainly haven't heard of one. Okay. Okay. Still, I'm, I'm still looking for that. So I think I'm, th I'm, I'm rapidly getting to the point where I ask every one of our guests <laughs> that particular question. So if anybody, if anybody is listening or, or seeing and knows about any kind of recording like that, we are all still uh, looking for such a thing. Yeah, yeah I'm trying to think where, where it would be even. Yeah, like I wonder right. if it, you know, I wouldn't surprise me as like maybe in the '80s as it became more of a product. Like maybe they were you know just for market research purposes. Maybe they're going to do some kind of uh, you know testing or, or or focus group or something where they're they're going to show or record something. I don't know. It's just so, so surprising that none of that exists. Right. Well, I mean, claim, you know, I mean, go ahead, John. I was just going to say, I was just talking to my friend Ethan Gilsdorf the other day, and I mean, he, he took some home Super 8 videos of, like, his group playing in the early 80s, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was telling me that, like, you know, we put them up on YouTube or whatever, and, like, a bunch of, like, documentaries wanted to use it, because they, they can't find stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Like, even just yeah. your playgroup, right, doing this in, in the 80s, something that's, like, in era, um, it, I think they are just quite, they're quite rare and yeah. that they survive is the problem. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot were taken. I mean, again, you, you see people at Gen Con still in like, you know, 69 talking about people showing up with video cameras, like again, to, to record things or local TV stations attending right. and taking some footage, yeah. but like just, it just didn't survive. That's, it's the survival, I'm sure, that must be the problem. Because I definitely have a memory as a kid in, like, maybe, say, 80, 86, 87, somewhere around there, of actually taking a tape recorder and recording a session once. Um, and probably afterwards listening to it and going, oh, this isn't very good. And then destroying or re over recording over it because I needed the tape, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if there weren't, you know, recordings that were made but then were, you know, overwritten just because media is was expensive at the time and reusable you know i just made a note yeah. here because i think i have a videotape from like 84 or 85 of, of my friends playing paranoia in which I, and it was done in game so i gave them the video camera as the tricorder in character yep and then they videotaped the game from the player's perspective uh i bet i might have that someplace but then that's actually non-trivial to get to get digitized nowadays yeah 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 fascinating well, we are. So we'll put we'll put a we'll put a we'll put a pin in that and make that in our academic paper. We will put that in the further research or open questions section at the end of the paper. Excellent, excellent. Fair enough. We are running just about uh, to the end here. Uh, does anybody have any any final thoughts on? Uh, wow, I, I can't even summarize this conversation. Uh, <laughs> John, is there anything about the elusive shift that we we that you really wanted to get in today that we didn't manage to touch on? No, not really. I think you got it. It's it's a book about why why people thought there was this separate genre of RPGs and what they thought it meant for something to be an RPG. I mm -hmm. thought it was worth writing about. That's it. <laughs> Excellent. I, I haven't read every word yet, but I've already been hit by a couple of thunderbolts along the way. So it's it's highly highly worth getting and highly worth the read. Wonderful work. Completely agree. Yeah, thanks. Completely agree. Yeah. Uh, folks, if you have uh, any further comments or if you want to tell us about a recording that you're aware of of early D&D uh, &D play, please leave us uh, some comments in the comments section below. Uh, we'd really appreciate it. I'd like to hear from you. Uh, likewise, if you're uh, viewing this on YouTube after the fact, take a moment to look in the description field and uh, follow the link to our sponsor, Describe. Uh, Dan, tell us, tell us a little bit about uh, what Describe offers. Yeah, Describe is our new sponsor, and they are purveyors of finely crafted box text. 
So what they do is they produce short, evocative, descriptive text that you can use to save prep time in your adventures, fleshing out locations or monsters or new spells or something like that. Uh, and they even have an instant search feature, digital search, it's all the rage is what I hear, that allows <laughs> you to find awesome descriptions that will surprise your players when you have a random encounter or your players pr surprise you by going totally off the rails. Uh, professional writers of uh, box text at describe.com. Yeah, check check that out at describe.com slash wandering. That's D-S-C-R-Y-B dot com slash wandering. And uh, if you uh, want to uh, subscribe to one of their services, uh, please use the digital code wandering uh, to get a 10% discount from your friends here at Wandering DMs. Fantastic. Uh, if you're new to the show, uh, remember, that, of course, that you can like, follow, and subscribe to us, The Wandering DMs, for content like this on a bunch of social media sites like Twitch and YouTube and Twitter and Facebook. And we, are, uh, we do have the handle Wandering DMs on all of those sites, so please look for us there. Uh, likewise, if you would like to listen to us uh, in audio podcast format, you can do so uh, by downloading the podcast at our website. That's wanderingdms.com. Uh, it's also carried by various podcast distributors such as iTunes and Google Podcast and Spotify. If you're listening to us on one of those carriers, please take a moment to rate and review us there on that site. Uh, we really appreciate it, and it helps uh, other fans find us on those, uh, on those locations. Great point, Paul. And of course, I've uh, got to give a big thanks to all of our generous patrons who support the Wandering DMs and all of our multiple shows. Uh, of course, we could not have guests, wonderful guests like John Peterson on the show without your generous support. <laughs> um, if you are in a position that you would like to join uh, our patrons in supporting Wandering DMs, please do visit patreon.com slash wandering DMs and pick the tier that uh, is appropriate for you. And of course, uh, just for starters, we will have we will continue the chat with some of our patrons on our uh, Discord server right after this show. Uh, don't forget uh, upcoming shows. Uh, Paul will be back with 10 Dead Rats, a delightful storytelling role-playing game that matches up D&D and Warhammer and other elements uh, Thursday at 8. Um, and then I think in two weeks, I'll be back with Isabel for another hardcore head-to-head -head war game uh, with fantasy miniatures on a Saturday night. Uh, you heard about the, the, the plague show that we'll be having for Valentine's Day next week, so be back to that. Huge uh, thanks to John Peterson, and we hope that you'll look for his book, The Elusive Shift, and that you'll visit his website, uh, playingattheworld.blogspot.com. John, thank you so much for your time uh, being with us today. Dan, Paul, again, thanks so much for having me. Uh, don't forget, of course, we're back uh, next week, uh, 1 p.m. Easter time. Uh, we'll be actually me and Isabel uh, next week, so be back for that. Uh, please join us next week for another thought-provoking discussion. We'll see you then.